Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for um, attending our webinar today. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm from a company called Signition, um, which is a company sponsoring this um, webinar. And we develop immersive online virtual worlds to help students conceptually understand mathematics and achieve computational fluency. The, the topic you're going to hear today is using neuroscience to improve learning fractions. Okay, I'm happy to introduce you to our speaker today, which is Dr. Valerie Salampour. She holds a master's degree in clinical developmental psychology with a focus on development of complex cognitive function in children. And she has a PhD in psychology with a focus on understanding the brain's dopamine reward system. Her current work focuses on how dopamine can be used to enhance learning. She was also a researcher at Stanford University, examining neural correlates of mathematical processing in children. Currently, Valerie is a researcher at the Rodman Research Institute in Toronto and a consultant at the to develop educational video games that apply the principles of neuroscience towards learning mathematics. Her work has been published in top journals such as Science, Nature Neuroscience, PNAS, and she has received prestigious national and international awards and worldwide media coverage for her research. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and give it over to Dr. Salampour. Thank you very much, Carolyn. It's great to be here. And uh, I'd like to talk to you today about how we can use scientific principles of neuroscience and an understanding of how the brain processes information to improve the way that students learn fractions. So um, a little bit about uh, my background. I, as Carolyn mentioned, I do have a PhD from McGill University where I studied dopamine systems in the brain. And I also have a master's in clinical psychology from York University to study cognitive development in children. And uh, I've also um, conducted research at Stanford and at the Rotman Research Institute to better understand mathematical processing in the brain as well as neural connectivity and how different parts of the brain integrate with each other to process information. I'm currently a researcher and my research interests include brain development in children. And this is very much personally biased because I have two little munchkins at home. <laughs> and uh, I very much want to help them uh, reach their full cognitive potential. So I'm particularly interested in applying what we know about neuroscience and how the brain works um, to teach in a way that prepares the brain for further learning. So this goes beyond just teaching the material that needs to be learned. We'd be teaching in a way that makes it easier to integrate new information with the mental representations of a phenomenon. And uh, this would obviously help to facilitate future learning. So in mathematics, possibly more so than any other topic, every new concept builds on earlier understanding. So teaching in a way that prepares the brain for further learning is especially important. Um, there are a number of very clever ways that we can do this. And most of these involve um, establishing a neural network around the topic. So by a neural network, I mean establishing connections between a variety of brain areas uh, that are all related to a topic or a concept. And uh, a second line of strategies that can be implemented involve, um, involve techniques to help learning and memory from a neurochemical perspective. Uh, so for example, strategies that involve increasing dopamine. Some of you may have heard of this before. Uh, it's a neurochemical that can be enhanced when something is rewarding or salient. So why is this important? Well, there's been a large body of evidence in neuroscience showing that increasing dopamine at the right time helps to stamp in or solidify new learning. And uh, emotional arousal can also increase dopamine and other neurochemicals as well that attach significance uh, to memories and make them easier to remember. So as you can imagine, we can take advantage of that if we want people to remember something. Uh, it's also a similar idea with um, capturing people's attention or increasing intrinsic motivation. And in terms of math specific research interests, I'm very interested in understanding how the brain processes mathematics, as well as how we can use this knowledge to enhance the way that children learn and process mathematical information. 
So now that you know a little bit about me, maybe we can start the poll questions and find out a little bit more about you. Uh, so we're wondering a little bit about you, whether you're elementary school teacher, middle school teacher, high school teacher, instructional coach or administrator, or other, and if it's other, if you could please specify in the chat. Wonderful. Uh, so the question is, which grades do you teach, coach or administer? Grade four, grade five, grade six, grade seven. So critical ones for fractions, although certainly not the only ones. <laughs> and other. Okay, so uh, it looks like, uh, yep, a lot of people from grades outside of the four to seven. Interesting. Okay, so we'll close that. Uh, so the next question that I have for you is, which aspect of fractions are your students struggling with the most? So it'd be great to see some responses in the chat uh, text box. It's a fairly important question. It seems like it's an ongoing problem. <laughs> so, uh, so as you're typing that, I'll just uh, move on to the next slide. So the problem seems to be that math is difficult. <laughs> so it requires various forms of attention. You need, in order to solve a math problem, you need focused attention, uh, inhibition of distractions, shifting between different mental sets, multitasking. You also need working memory. So you need both auditory and visual spatial working memory. Um, there's a lot of spatial and abstract reasoning involved. And this is probably one of the most challenging things. Um, when people are performing math problems. Uh, you also need to uh, tap into your number sense and estimation resources in the brain. And uh, often you recruit executive functions. These are things such as organizing and sequencing information, reasoning and problem solving, as well as metacognition. So realizing what we know and we don't know about a problem and how to go about solving it. And of course, uh, retreating math facts from stored memory and integrating this information with previously stored knowledge. So this is cognitively taxing. Math definitely takes a toll on your brain. Without a doubt, it's tough. <laughs> so it does exercise many parts of your brain. Um, as you can see, this is your brain on math. So these regions aren't necessarily recruited every time that you solve a math problem, but they can be. <laughs> And so here's the twist. So if we can start to think about how we can actually um, enhance learning by recruiting and involving all of these regions to establish a more elaborate network in the brain that centers around the math topic. So I'll explore that in detail very soon. At first, I'd like to show you a summary of what I'd like to talk to you about today. So the question is, how can we facilitate mathematical processing? And I'll talk to you about three ways that this can be done based on neuroscientific principles. So first, we can help with information processing. We can implement strategies that help with encoding, retention, and retrieval of mathematical information based on knowledge about how this, these happen in the brain. And the second, uh, very important, is uh, establishing a deep conceptual understanding. So teachers know that conceptual understanding is really critical. And unfortunately, many students struggle with this for various reasons. Um, so one way that we can help with this is to decrease the need for some of the supporting mentally taxing cognitive functions involved in mathematical processing that we talked about on the previous slide. So these are things like working memory, attention, executive function, and spatial reasoning until an appropriate level of conceptual understanding has been reached. Now here comes the real challenge. We can do all of these things generally for a group of people, but teachers know all too well that each student is at a different level of ability and understanding for each of these. So you'd never find two students who are at the exact same place in terms of their working memory, attention, executive functions, spatial reasoning, and conceptual understanding, right? Uh, so how can we possibly implement a program that teaches, that, that takes each student's needs into consideration? Designing such a program would be wonderful uh, in theory, but it would place a lot of unnecessary strain on teachers to have to figure out exactly where each student's thinking and abilities lie and precisely what form of instruction that student needs and also what pace they need to deliver it at. So the good news is that we have computers and they can do wonderful things that make our lives easier. Uh, so with advancing technology, 
this undue stress on the teachers can be relieved to some extent because we can always design new programs um, to, to carefully collect data about each student's abilities based on their performance and then compute the necessary information to assess and identify what their individual needs are and deliver the information at the pace that that individual needs. So um, based on uh, realizing this, I, um, a few years ago, I joined forces with a company called Signition to develop a product that does exactly what I described. And uh, this is a game called um, uh, Fogstone Isle. It's a free game. Um, it's available for teachers and students to use online. So there's nothing to download. And this game was really developed uh, specifically to address the goals that I just mentioned, because there was a need for it. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, that uh, right now and how it works on neuroscientific principles. So the first question is why fractions? <laughs> so we started with fractions because numerous studies have shown that sixth grade mathematics represents a key turning point in students' mathematical career. So um, I, one example of the studies, although there are many, uh, is the British cohort study. This was a longitudinal study that uh, looked at over 3,000 uh, children longitudinally and found that students' understanding of fractions in the sixth grade is one of the strongest predictors of how well they'll do in math in later years. So for example, when they're 16, their overall academic achievement is predicted by, by their knowledge of fractions in sixth grade. Um, and this is largely because uh, understanding algebra is so influenced by understanding fractions. So it comes back down to two things that we talked about. One is the importance of conceptual understanding. So if a student um, has a solid understanding of fractions and precisely what they represent early on, then it's likely that they'll perform much better with algebra. And the second related idea is that each topic builds upon previously acquired knowledge. So we want to prepare the brain for further learning. And understanding fractions means that you understand division, and it sets you up for understanding percentages, decimals, ratios, and proportions, etc. So there's, there's really no need to convince a teacher how important fractions are. Um, so the problem is that they're so poorly understood. A large number of studies have shown that uh, many older students or even adults continue to struggle with fractions, right? So um, the National Assessment of Education Progress, for example, found that 50% of eighth graders can't order the fractions that you see here, right? So it's, it's definitely a big problem. So the game that I contributed to is aimed at developing a very solid foundation of what fractions represent and how they're used, as well as diving deep into fraction addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, as well as other concepts such as fraction equivalence and estimation, and simplification. So the point here is to make sure that children leave the sixth grade with a very thorough understanding of fraction concepts and, um, and essentially become experts in applying this knowledge to procedural aspects of problem solving with fractions. So I think uh, one of the most important things to point out is that rather than taking boring homework and dressing it up into a computer game, um, this is intended to be a fun and immersive computer game in which math is intrinsic. So that's really important. So you're sort of working in this virtual environment where math is a part of what you're doing. Um, so in other words, it has real world <laughs> relevance to building and crafting activities that the students are immersed in. And this is really important because for this to work, we need to get students' dopamine levels right up there. <laughs> uh, dopamine is the brain chemical that's important for consolidating information. And believe me when I say a lot of thought went into how we're going to increase these dopamine levels at the right time, having it correspond to what needs to be learned. So on that note, uh, the game is very fun to play. Um, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from students uh, and uh, because they're actually creating parts of their own unique virtual world in the game. And this becomes an investment and something they wanna come back to throughout the year so we can use it to refresh their skills. So imagine if Minecraft was designed to teach mathematics, which, which it can be in some cases, right? Uh, 
So another uh, great feature that I think teachers would appreciate is the third point that I talked about, which is that the game chief keeps track of everything that students do and provides clear and readable uh, reports to the teachers about how how much each student understands about different aspects of fractions. So this way you can get an estimate of each student's conceptual understanding. So now I'd like to talk to you about the specific details of how mathematical processing can be facilitated based on neuroscientific knowledge. So as we do this, I'll use examples from the game to illustrate how neuroscientific um, theory can be applied, neuroscientific theory and research can be applied to teach children. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that there are three techniques that we can apply to facilitate mathematical processing. So now I'll go over these in more detail. Uh, so the first one was optimizing information processing, optimizing learning. So before we can optimize information processing, we have to consider how learning occurs in the brain. So in the brain, learning is represented by formation of new associations. Uh, two or more things that were not previously associated with each other become linked together. And that means that learning has occurred. So neurobiologically, a new connection can appear between two or more neurons. So a great example of this is the massive amount of learning that happens in the first couple of years of life. It's just incredible. <laughs> and I'm experiencing that firsthand. Uh, so you can see the number of neurons stay the same. Uh, from newborn to one month to six months to two years, but the connections in between them increases. And that's what's representing the massive amount of learning that's going on. Very impressive. So um, it's important to realize though that learning in, is more than just encoding. You also have to retrieve this information as quickly as possible when needed. So we need to find ways of strengthening this connection. And integration is also very important. Uh, as we discussed, most, math most mathematical learning builds upon previously learned concepts. So as you can imagine, it would be very useful if the students could quickly recall all of the information that they've previously learned on a topic when something new is being added to it during the lesson. So here's an example of how this information could be integrated. Of course, these are just very simple. Uh, schemas, representations um, of that, um, just to show you an idea of how things work in the brain, but obviously it's much more complex. <laughs> so here's an example of how new information could be integrated. Um, again, this is not a very efficient way. And now here is an example of a much more efficient way. So as you can see, everything here is linked together. And this is encoded as a very coherent network. An activation of any of these cells is likely to activate the rest of the network as well. So this is called connectivity, and it's extremely important in determining how quickly and effectively an individual can process information in the brain. Uh, so there are three essential ways, at least, that we can use this information to enhance information processing. Um, so enhance encoding, retention, and retrieval, and I'll talk about those uh, individually. We can encode through multiple pathways. We can um, uh, facilitate the integration of encoded information, and we can also strengthen neural connections. So I'll talk about those. So um, at a very basic level, if we're interested in learning, we would be looking at the hippocampus, where information is consolidated and memories are created. So if a student needs to learn to solve this problem, they can use a direct route from the mental calculation regions of the brain and the parietal lobe, for example, and create a pathway to the hippocampus. And then later, when this information is needed again, how well it's recalled depends on how efficiently these pathways can be reactivated. So our goal is to maximize the number of pathways associated with a mathematical concept. So when it needs to be retrieved, it can be done so effectively and efficiently. Um, so one, day that, one way that we might uh, want to do this is by presenting the same information through different systems in the brain. Okay, so um, for example, in the game, uh, fractions are displayed through visual models. Uh, in this example, we have a number line and fraction bars, which uh, teachers know are known to be highly effective in teaching fractions. 
right? And uh, seeing different ways of visualizing this mathematical information results in the creation of a more diverse network of brain regions. So you can see that on the image on the right that represents this, this information about the mathematical concept that you're trying to learn fractions in this example. So what's important here is that since the different means of presenting the information are processed simultaneously, this information is um, encoded into an integrated network and the various parts of which become more easily accessible when one node gets activated. So in addition to visual models, we also use spatial models to represent the same mathematical concepts to let the students see what those abstract symbolic numbers actually look like in space. So this also allows students to visualize fractions in everyday life. Um, as you can see here, um, as they're deciding how much water they want to irrigate, that the fractions are popping up and that they can start to manipulate this and play with this. And an added benefit of this method is we can reach out to students who are better at learning math when it's represented visually. So next we've implemented an interactive tutorial that takes students uh, through examples when a new concept is introduced. So the purpose of this is to ensure that students learn the sequential steps of solving a problem in an active way. So rather than passively listening or observing. So this is really important because it recruits um, the motor learning pathways in the brain, which can be integrated with the rest of the network centering around the math concept. So as you can see on the brain image on the right here, uh, the network is becoming more and more elaborate, the network representing a, a simple uh, problem, solve, problem that needs to be solved. And so more brain regions are recruited to process the same information. And um, this, is, this is what I was referring to when I showed you the earlier slide with a picture of a brain with many regions that could potentially be activated when you're solving math problems. So the more areas that we recruit, the more elaborate this network becomes and activating one node can prime uh, the other nodes so that they're more easily called upon and the students get a more comprehensive idea of what that concept represents. So let's illustrate this with an example. Uh, what is Ratatouille? Uh, so some of you may have heard of this, but uh, uh, it might take a while to try to remember what it is. Uh, some of you may have tasted it or know what it smells like or what it looks like. And maybe even made this tasty dish yourself in the past. <laughs> uh, if that's the case, then you're much more likely to quickly recall what it is uh, because it's been processed through multiple systems in your brain. You're probably recalling what it is faster than someone else who's not had those experiences and is now digging deep in their brain to try to remember what this might be. A movie, <laughs> right? So you can probably see where I'm going with this. We also engage students with uh, estimation involving math concepts to increase cortical connectivity with specific uh, regions in the brain involved in estimation and number sense. And of course, both uh, symbolic numerals and non-symbolic representations of quantity, like the, the sub area that's being selected in this visual spatial representation are represented simultaneously to establish a more comprehensive network in the brain. And I do realize that I just have still images of um, how these have been implemented in the game, um, but uh, there will be a video demo at the end that describes these in, in a more animated way. <laughs> Um, so we discussed how the game was designed to present information through different pathways and systems in the brain, but now we'll discuss additional methods that we can use to, um, to implement to better integrate and strengthen this information stored in various parts of the brain. So we take advantage of the role that executive functions play in integrating relevant information from various parts of the brain. So success in this game depends largely on how well a student can strategize. Uh, so this involves strategizing, involves a number of executive or frontal lobe functions. And these are things like organizing thoughts, planning ahead, uh, considering multiple possibilities and their respective probabilities while incorporating all the available information. So that's really key. So you're um, 
that way integrating all of the information that you have stored in the various parts of your brain in order to be able to think ahead and solve this problem and do the reasoning and decision making that you need to make. So, and of course, these functions all have established pathways in the brain where information from various sources relevant to the task are again simultaneously recruited. So once again, increasing the chance that they're all going to be integrated into a coherence network. And here's a schema of that. <laughs> Um, so this in turn would increase the likelihood that the various pieces of information um, that are representing a math concept would be stored as a coherent unit. And the more connected these pathways are, the more likely that various parts will be recruited when one part of the system is recruited. So for example, the next time a student comes across the symbolic representation of a fraction, it's likely that the entire system of stored information would become activated and primed in the brain. And you can imagine all the benefit that this would have, not only for better understanding the information that's to be presented, but also any new information that is to be integrated um, with this recalled information. This, this really facilitates that process. So um, we talked about uh, once an association has been formed between two neurons, now transmission of information depend, depends on the efficiency of that connection. So an obvious way to strengthen this is practice. <laughs> so in other words, um, the more often this link is activated, the stronger it becomes in the brain. But we can also take shortcuts. This is exciting. So this can happen if certain neurochemicals are present when this link is activated. For example, dopamine. <laughs> I've brought this up a few times now. This is my favorite neurochemical. Uh, I'm a big fan. <laughs> Uh, a neurochemical that makes a very significant contribution towards enhancing the strength of learned information. As a side note, <laughs> knowing about this neurochemical has changed my life. I can teach my children anything as long as I carefully embed them within an activity that increases their dopamine. Um, so for, for my toddler, this is trains. Uh, taking advantage of the fact that uh, his dopamine levels are already quite high when he's playing with trains or even around trains, I can figure out um, if I can figure out ways to embed what I need him to learn within a train related activity, then this really helps with consolidating that newly learned information. So it's, it's a wonderful chemical. <laughs> Uh, so in the game, we've carefully implemented a number of elements that can increase the release of neurochemicals that specifically contribute to uh, enhancing learning. For example, certain states such as attentional arousal or salience provide these shortcuts towards strengthening learned information. And as long as the um, state and the information are carefully paired together, then this can happen. Uh, a lot of thought went into that. <laughs> so in the example here, we have um, weed fights. And uh, so these are intense moments of immediate danger where you could win or lose the battle with some element of skill and some element of chance involved. And um, as a side note, the element of chance is also really important for releasing dopamine, like a slot machine, for example. <laughs> uh, so um, similarly, emotional arousal is highly effective in modifying the way that uh, information is encoded and retrieved. So um, you can imagine that this is really easy to do in video games. Uh, so it's just a matter of pairing it up with the right information. In this example, emotions are manipulated through a desire to protect your investment in the farm and, uh, and accomplishments. So a well-established method of releasing dopamine, of course, is through uh, extrinsic rewards. Um, so these are like rewards and reinforcements, and we've used a diverse variety of these uh, throughout the game. And these have been paired with those conceptual learning moments, those aha moments. And uh, this pairing is again important for consolidation. So finally, intrinsic motivation. That's another one that's easily overlooked, uh, has been linked with improved encoding of information. Um, we increase the likelihood of getting students intrinsically motivated by implementing elements that can increase flow. So um, by matching the player's abilities through adaptive algorithms. So that has been demonstrated to increase their flow and their desire to wanna play the game, their intrinsic motivation, basically. 
uh, as well as a cumulative display of their accomplishments of various types through very creative outlets. And this is exciting for anybody really. Um, so this is a building game where small accomplishments can contribute to building very unique landscapes and cities that allow the player to display their own creativity in a way that they might not otherwise get to do in math class. So uh, to summarize that section that we just talked about, I'll pull up an example and then uh, briefly go over some of the topics that we talked about. So this is an example of a game. Um, it's called the farm plot game within that fog sauna where you're, you're um, building crops. Uh, so here, as you can see, um, visual spatial systems are activated because you are uh, looking at number lines to determine how much water you have on the right, for example. Um, and the area models right in the middle is, uh, allowing you to choose the sub area that you want to irrigate. And of course you can manipulate and play around with that. But what's important is that that visual spatial representation is immediately linked with the numerical representation of the corresponding fraction. And of course the frontal systems of the brain, so the executive functions and the quantitative areas and the parietal lobe are also recruited as players use estimation and number sense to estimate and compare choices and their potential outcomes. Uh, there's a there's a lot of thinking that has to go on at the same time, and that's sort of what I was targeting before. So for each move in the game, they have to, again, simultaneously consider a variety of quantitative and visual spatial information. So they have to think about how much water remains, how much space their plants are taking up in the farm, how much space the weeds are taking up in the farm, how close the weeds are to their plants, um, strength the strength of the various nodes on the plants and the weeds, and how this could influence where they may wish, may wish to attack. So, and uh, because they can also play around with the various numbers, um, this also helps to uh, target those motor learning regions as well. And of course, risks and rewards are carefully designed to motivate students to come up with better strategies each time that they play. So uh, comparing multiple strategies encourages students to retrieve all the relevant information that they know about these math topics uh, surrounding that math concept. So this practice um, can be highly valuable for consolidating that newly acquired information and uh, previous knowledge into a coherent unit. And of course, additional techniques are used to associate decisions made in the game with increased emotional arousal, such as the weed fights that we talked about and salience. So the impending destruction of the farm by the weeds, uh, reward values such as power-ups and intrinsic motivation, investments in the farm to increase dopamine levels associated with mathematical problem solving. Now, um, moving on to the number two that we talked about, uh, one of the most important things that we can do when teaching fraction concept or any other new concept in the classroom is to consider which other cognitive functions are required to process this information and then try to find ways of actually minimizing uh, how much supportive cognitive functions students will need to process the conceptual information. So in other words, decreasing cognitive demands allow students to allocate their mental resources to processing the conceptual information. So this method also allows them uh, to be at the same level, even if they have, if, even if they're struggling with one or more of those supportive cognitive functions. So if they have poor attention, poor working memory, poor executive functions in general, if teachers can find ways to decrease the amount that those are required to understand the information, then you're sort of putting everyone on the same level, the same playing field. Uh, to illustrate this with uh, fractions example, let's go back to that example that I presented earlier, where 50% of eighth graders had trouble with this. Uh, they had to order these fractions. Um, so uh, a question for you is, how would you go about doing this? Um, if you could take a minute and think about which cognitive processes you may be activating, or recruiting to resolve a problem like this. Um, so for example, you can keep track of any mental imagery that you're bringing up uh, to compare these and keep track of how much information you are keeping track of as you go along. And another thing to keep in mind is uh, you're, you're all probably experts on this, but um, 
keeping in mind how a student who is not an expert uh, in, in this area might go about solving this problem and how much information they would need to keep track of in their mind as they go about solving this, which cognitive functions they might need to recruit. Um, so as you're doing that, uh, in order to solve this, most people need a mental representation of some sort. They need some kind of a mental representation of quantity for each item. So this could be a number line, a fraction bar, or a circle, something along those lines. Um, and you have to keep track of at least two positions of quantity uh, in your working memory as you're computing the location of the third, right? And uh, let's see, the, it, as I was alluding to before, conceptual knowledge also makes a huge difference. So the difference between experts and novices, uh, if you're quickly identifying that five over nine is more than half, while the other two are less than half, you can, you can um, help order the largest quantity at least. Uh, and the knowledge that the combination of a smaller numerator and a larger denominator means a smaller quantity can help you identify the smallest quantity. So, so that conceptual knowledge will really help you obviously in, in doing this uh, task. Now, a student who doesn't have the conceptual fluency would need to perform a number of mental calculations. Um, while they're performing this and visual uh, visual computations as well. Um, and they're much more likely to make errors, right? Because that, that's a lot of information to keep in your mind. Uh, and then that's even if you have perfect working memory. So um, in, in both cases, working memory is involved much more if, if it's unfamiliar and lacking conceptual knowledge. Um, so so this, this sort of becomes a vicious cycle, as you can imagine, if you have low working memory, this leads to poor understanding. And if you have poor understanding, that requires more working memory. So it becomes challenging. And when I say low working memory, even if you don't necessarily have uh, poor working memory, it's, it's still challenging without um, the conceptual information because you, you still have to keep some information in mind. And uh, so that that in itself is quite challenging. So what's the solution? The solution is to achieve a deeper conceptual understanding by decreasing working memory loads and other, uh, other functions that are required until students understand that concept. So here's an example of how we've implemented that in the game, uh, for example. Um, we've carefully implemented tools that can be used in place of supportive cognitive functions like working memory to allow students to achieve a deep conceptual understanding and uh, so this takes out a lot of the cognitive effort so that students can focus on focus on their mental focus their mental resources on understanding the concepts. And uh, once the mental resources, um, so, sorry, once the concepts have been mastered, then the option of using these tools is gradually removed to allow students to integrate working memory back into the problem solving and thereby achieve procedural fluency. So let's look at this uh, example that we have here. Um, here, the students are adding uh, two bricks together in order to complete a row so they can add it onto their building. And um, it's difficult uh, immediately to try to figure out what the common denominator might be. Um, so it's, it's going to be 12, but then you have to figure that out first and then keep that in mind while you figure out that you have to multiply the first one by four. But what you could do is uh, press this button and pull up a sketchpad. So what's a sketchpad? It's basically your, um, it, it's digital working memory. So we've essentially created a space where uh, we can provide supports for the other cognitive functions so we can get the conceptual point across, right? Um, so students will understand what they need to do in the situation without having to tax their working memory abilities. So here they see, okay, well, if, if the common denominator needs to be 12, then I can just move uh, four into the slot and multiply that by four. And now we have similar denominators. And then they move the first brick down into the second row and everything is added together for them. So they don't need to necessarily do their multiplication tables and tax their working memory at that time because they're still sort of learning the concept of how things work and how these fractions work and what they represent. And then, of course, once that has been mastered, then these tools are 
sort of slowly removed. And uh, so that's the idea behind that. I'll give you another example here. Um, if they're adding these two bricks, uh, we make it a lot easier for them to be able to see what they need to do so that they understand how this works without, again, taxing their working memories. And again, if you're interested in finding out more about this, please make sure that you stay tuned for the animated video afterwards, which will give you more detail about how this works. Now, the third uh, topic that I talked about was individualized instruction. Uh, so the idea here is how can we tailor the steps to meet um, individuals' needs? And again, computers make this really easy because you can collect information about each student's understanding based on their performance. So you can see, okay, well, what exactly are they having trouble with? Have they mastered like denominators? Um, or is it is it the multiplication that they're having trouble with? Is it unlike denominator? What is it exactly that they're having trouble with? And uh, so we've definitely integrated that into the program so that teachers will have a profile of all the students and exactly what their knowledge is. So I'd like to summarize before we move into the Q&A section. Um, so again, the goal is to go beyond teaching math skills. It's really all about uh, preparing the brain for further mathematical learning by creating and exercising connections between various systems that are required to process a range of simple to complex mathematical information. And uh, here we go. So now if there are any questions, I'd be very happy to take them. And just a reminder that after the questions, there will be that video demo. Okay, thank you, Valerie. That was a great presentation. Um, there's lots of questions, so I'm going to go ahead and go through them one by one. Valerie, can you hear me okay? I can, yes. Valerie, can you? Okay, great. Okay, so first question was, does, does it require Flash? Our students have iPads, but they don't have Flash. Will we have to use computers to play the game? And I answered this in the chat. I can go ahead and answer this one, Valerie. So the game works on both um, desktop, um, laptop, Chromebooks, iPads. So there's a variety of different types of computers that you can use. Um, to play the game. Okay, next question is, how can we tell the difference between understanding something and just remembering how to do it? And this is from Michelle from New Jersey. Uh, yes, that's a very good question. And usually by how well it can be generalized to something else. So um, so if, if they're repeatedly doing uh, fractions in one format or the same numbers, then obviously they may have just memorized how to do that. But if now they have to convert that information to a relatively novel scenario where it's a different format, different numbers, a different way of asking the question, then you can tell if they've uh, achieved a conceptual understanding. Okay, thank you. Um, here's another one. Would This is from Renee in West Virginia. Would students be overwhelmed with the information and just click or give up? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? I didn't say. Yes, um, so I think what Renee is asking, um, in the game, would students be overwhelmed with the information and just click or give up? And, and I guess one of the things I want to say is um, when when kids first start the game, we have um, tutorials to help them to teach them how to play the game and also to teach them how to add or subtract fractions if they're on the fraction addition game. So there's a lot of tutorials and lessonware that is built into these games. And uh, to Valerie, add to you want that, to add anything to that? Yes, uh, to add to that. Um, so this this is sort of one of the key elements of um, trying to teach that all teachers know it's it's really difficult to understand exactly which level each student is um, in terms of their conceptual understanding and again in terms of all of those supportive functions uh, that are required so it's it's not just about um, uh, again conceptual understanding but w where are you on your working memory your attention your executive function so all of those really make a difference and the nice thing again about computerized uh, games is that you can collect that information as you are, um, as, as students are performing on this and adapt everything to them in a way that's really difficult to do if you're not using a computer. So, and this game does do that. That's definitely one of the benefits is that it's, it's highly adaptive to each student and moves along according to their abilities. 
Okay, another question was, do students need to log in and can I track their progress? Does it save their progress when they log out or do they have to start over after logging out? I think that's a question for Carolyn, but <laughs> yes, it's yes. All okay, of I'll go ahead and answer. That. <laughs> um, yes, whenever the students play the game, um, it saves whatever they have crafted in their environment in in their virtual world. So when they log in the next time, everything that they've done previously is already there. Okay, um, and we have a comprehensive teacher workstation that goes along with the game, where you can track um, in a lot of detail. Um, kids' progress. So, for instance, on fraction addition, we have five conceptual leaps that they have to go through to understand fraction addition, and you can track their pro process, pro progress at each con conceptual level. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one more question, and then after the demo, um, we will take some more questions. Um, let's see. Uh, how does activating or increasing dopamine levels help students with poor working memory? This is um, from Adrian in Arizona. Uh, that's a very excellent question that I could talk about for a long time. So um, there, there are two separate elements here. Uh, dopamine overall contributes to um, working memory, but in a, in a somewhat different way that we've talked about uh, today. So uh, let me just repeat the question. So the question is, how does dopamine contribute to enhancing working memory? Um, it's not so much that it's enhancing their working memory, but it's enhancing their... It, what we're trying to do is find ways to increase dopamine to consolidate the information that they're learning. The role of dopamine and working memory in itself is sort of quite complex and not uh, necessarily um, something we can cover here, but... The idea is that if you have higher dopamine levels, you understand the information better and you can retrieve it faster. So then it requires less working memory to process the rest of the information. So if you have solid foundations, again, when we were talking about um, the amount of working memory that you need depends on your conceptual information of how much you understand about a topic. And then so you don't have to go through and do all those um, different processes that you would need to do if you don't have access to this quickly retrieved information. And again, if you have dopamine available at the time of encoding, then you can consolidate this information faster and you can retrieve it faster. Okay, thank you, Valerie. I think we're gonna hold questions right now and then um, start the five minute demo and then we can take a few more questions after that. Welcome to my island. Because I have this big inlet from the ocean on my island, I decided I wanted to build a boathouse over here. And then with a nice view of the bay, I built myself a big compound to live in, planted some gardens where I can get fresh fruit and vegetables to eat. Let me show you how you might go about building such a structure. First thing I do is I choose to make a building, and I think this time I want to build a little cabin. So uh, I'm going to lay out a blueprint for it. Here's the footprint of my cabin. Let's make it just one story high. And I want red brick walls. And I'm ready to start building. Here is uh, an initial inventory of bricks that I can use to start building. And the way you build is you have to fill. These rows are templates for building. And they also happen to be number lines. So you fill a row with exactly three bricks, and those three bricks have to completely fill the row. Three bricks have to be exactly two units. Once you've filled a number of these rows, you can submit them to your building, and the bricks get laid out around your building. Let's see. I'm going to start with this two-thirds brick here. I'll drop it in, and that little animal that just dropped in a second brick is called a gruffin. So the Gruffin's my assistant, so I choose the first brick, it gave me a second brick, and now I have to figure out what size brick I need to fill up the rest of that row. So first thing I have to do is um, add up these two fractions and see what's left. I have a tool that can help me do that called the sketch pad, and so here I see um, these are fraction bars over a number line, and I need to figure out how am I going to add up these fractions to see what the 
sum is of the length. Now at this point, I've already received some lessons in the need to find common denominators so you can add fractions together. And if I don't remember how to do that, I might explore a bit taking these multiplicative identities and seeing what I get. If I do remember, I might go directly to the right answer. So I multiply this by 5 over 5, this by 3 over 3. And sure enough, you can see both visually with these lines um, and symbolically seeing the fraction symbols that I've come to a like denominator, 6 fifteenths plus 10 fifteenths. So now, let me add them up. And to do that, all I need to do is slide it over, and I get the sum right here. So notice, it, the, the, um, the game determined that sum. My main work at this point was to figure out how to get a common denominator. So we do that intentionally in order to reduce working memory load and let the player at this point focus on that concept that we're trying to teach them. So now I need to figure out what size brick I need to fill up the rest of this row out of the bricks in my inventory. If I click on this box here with the sum, I could move between the um, mixed number and the improper fraction, and I get to choose which one I want to look at in order to do the mental arithmetic to figure out which brick will fill up my row. Now, this is a very fundamental design principle we have, which is for every type of transformation that you learn about, whether it's finding equivalent, equivalent fractions, simplifying fractions, uh, moving between mixed numbers and um, improper fractions, rather than just teaching a transformation, we want to give the player the opportunity to see why the transformation may or may not be useful at any time. So by clicking between these two versions, the player gets to decide which one do I want to look at, the improper fraction or the mixed number, to do this mental arithmetic. And so I see in this case, it's a lot easier to do the mental arithmetic with the mixed number. So in other words, I've learned that this is a transformation that can help me in certain cases make my problem easier, easier to solve. And that's why you do the various transformations that may be available at any time. So here I have 1 and 1 15th. I need to get to 2. So I grab the 14 15th brick, and I'm finished with that row. Now let's quickly do one more row. So here I'll grab a 5 6th brick, and I have a 2 6th brick. So in this case, the arithmetic is very easy. I put this together, and I'll finish this off with a 5 sixths brick. And now I'm going to submit these two rows to my building. So I submit them, and here I have this spinner, little game of chance that will tell me um, if I get a bonus. Can I get twice as many uh, bricks? This is a multiplier on the number of bricks that will be added to my building at this moment. And in fact, I got a multiplier of two. So I got a reward. I got twice as many bricks as I, uh, as rows that I had built, and I partially built my building at this point. Now we have a very strategic reason for having that little game of chance just when you're submitting rows, because I just exercised this new concept, and that game of chance triggers the dopamine system right after I've exercised that new concept, so it helps with consolidation. It makes my learning of that concept uh, more efficient. Now let's look at what the teacher's view of what's going on is. Imagine your classes in front of you, they're all building buildings, uh, you've been working on teaching fraction addition, and we can see all the activity going on in the classroom. So across the top we see the list of conceptual leaps that students need to make as they master fraction addition, and um, for each student, we see their status. If it's green, it means they've mastered that concept. Red means they're struggling with that concept. Yellow means they're working on and making progress with that concept. And blue means we don't have enough information yet on that concept for that student. Now, if we want more information about any particular student, we can click on that student and take a look. And for every game, we can see for, for, for that student, 
how they're doing, mastering every component concept, and within each concept, their procedural fluency. So, for example, here, with easier denominators and with harder denominators, how are they progressing on mastering that concept? So using this, you can make decisions about how to optimize what you want to be doing at that moment with your class. So I, I see a couple of questions that I'll answer really quick, quick. What grade levels are appropriate for this game? And the game was specifically be focused on fifth and sixth grade, which is when they're um, learning fraction, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and then division in sixth grade. Although we've seen some, we are, we do have an equivalent fraction game that we've seen um, that can be used for fourth grade. And then of course, if students are still struggling with fractions, they can use it in seventh and eighth grade. So it just depends on where the student is at. I think I, it's clock, so I think I need to go. Um, if you're interested in the game, I think I left my um, email address um, on the chat, and you can also go to Signition.com and register for the game, and we'd be happy to um, have you play it.